Uh, I have one lesson uh, from Slashdot and Kitten Wars, and you'll see why those two go together. Um, I want to talk about the social cost of cheap pseudonyms because I think there's a fundamental uh, cost uh, that we can play whack-a-mole and make it pop up in a different place, but we have to face uh, that fundamental cost and, and, and maybe think about uh, ways to, to deal with it. And then uh, it's not really directly related to the reputation system problem for, for, for our group, but to just the cold start of getting any community off, off the ground. And I have a framework for thinking about that. So uh, the lesson from Slashdot, meta moderation. Uh, in Slashdot, you know, people post, people suggest news articles. Some of them get selected to be, to be uh, published on Slashdot. Uh, other people comment. And then uh, some of the members get moderation points so that while they're reading, sometimes while they're reading, they get to plus one and, and minus one articles, uh, uh, comments rather. And then they have a meta moderation system where uh, people are asked to decide whether particular moderations were fair. Here's, here was the comment, here's the moderation that it, the plus one or minus one that it got, the label it got, and uh, you have to judge whether that was fair. Now there's a big contrast between the meta moderation and the moderation. One is commenting on the comments and one, the other is commenting on the, on the moderation. But the, the important distinction I want to bring up is that people who are moderating choose which items to moderate. The people who are meta moderating do not choose which things to meta moderate. So you, there's, and that has a big difference for manipulation. So if, if I get 10 of my buddies together and we decide we want to make all of Dan Whaley's comments get a minus one or a plus five, we can go searching for all of his comments and, uh, and, and do that. With 10 of us getting some, some mod points on any particular day, we can, we can make sure that Dan does, is really visible or really invisible that day. For the meta moderation, if I want to go in and make it look like Dan has always been an unfair moderator, I want to go, f when it, wherever he does a moderation, I'm going to go in and say, wow, that was fair. That's really hard to do because I don't get to choose which things I'm going to moderate. So I think this is uh, an idea that we might want to think about, uh, just keep it in the back of our minds. This assignment of people to moderate things is, is a potential resource for resisting manipulation. And, and just to show that it is a, uh, this is an idea that uh, has been used elsewhere besides slash dot meta moderation, the, uh, the competition for which is the cutest kitten in Kitten Wars goes by people come to the site and they show you two kittens. If I want to make my kitten picture be the one that, that is, you know, that floats to the top, it's really hard because I can't, I have to go through a lot of times till I got a pairing that involved my kitten picture. All right, so that's uh, uh, the first point. Second point, the social cost of cheap pseudonyms. And um, this is, uh, you know, first tried to formalize this and, and write about it in, in a paper with Eric Friedman that's a, a game theory paper titled The Social Cost of Cheap Pseudonyms. It's now 11 years ago. And one of the things I've, I was reflecting on as I put these together is the, the things that we, that we academics do that have a long uh, shelf life are very different from the things that, that get noticed right away. So uh, this is one that I you know, keep coming back to. So we've talked about persistent identifiers uh, yesterday, and I think by that people were mostly talking about if I have a, an ID that I use, will I keep getting to use it forever, or will I, will the company that issued the ID disappear, or will I forget my password and, and somehow I won't be able to use my identifier anymore? I or they turn, change the chains of service, they, they kill you, or they make it so that you don't want to use it anymore, they start charging you. So do, do I, will I continue to have the ability to use this if I want to? But there's the other side of persistence, and that's the one that I want to focus on, which is, if I don't want to keep using this, can I throw it away and start again? Uh, and if I can, if it's free to just start over, can we still expect reputations to be effective? That was kind of the, the question that, that we were trying to answer it in that paper, and the answer is yes. Reputations can still be effective, but only 
partly. So uh, a positive reputation can still be informative. If somebody has 2,000 positive uh, feedbacks from eBay, that means they did something and it probably means they, they at least know how to give good service on eBay. It also creates an incentive. The guy who's got the 2,000 positive feedbacks and no negatives on eBay would like in the 2,001st transaction to also not get a negative because they're anticipating that they have a big future ahead of them and, and, and uh, people know them and love them by that plus 2,000. So they have an incentive to keep uh, behaving well. They don't want to have to start over with a new, re with a new identifier that loses the, that plus 2,000 and they don't want to keep using this existing identifier if they get a negative. So, so far, so good. Even though people can start over, it's, it's still working. <laughs> but what about for the newcomers? Even for the newcomers, it, it, it can still have some eff incentive effect. So if I'm starting, and I know that the people who have several hundred positive uh, feedback on eBay are, are getting higher prices or more likely to sell their items, which they are, shown in some empirical studies, uh, then when I'm new, I would like to acquire a good reputation, so I have an incentive to behave well. But if everybody trusts all the newcomers, then there is an opportunity for repeated exploitation where I can come in, create an identifier, <coughs> cheat or chisel a little bit, start, get, a, get a negative feedback, start again with, with, a, new, with a new ID. So what typically happens is some form of newcomers having to pay their dues. That paying their dues might be that they, uh, on, on eBay, they get lower, lower prices and they're less likely to sell their items until they build up a good reputation. On some other sites, uh, the, uh, the newcomers have to be deferential to the, to the old timers. Uh, in, in other places, you could have um, that you've got to buy in. You actually have to pay with money to, to get started. There's many ways that the paying your dues can happen, but there has to be something that makes it not attractive to start over. Uh, that, that, it, that it can't be just, we would like to have, um, we would like to have a policy that says, most people are good, so if we don't know them, let's trust them. And then, a few of them will turn out to be bad and we'll kick them out or we'll, we'll do something to, to, to limit their damage. But in a world where there are cheap pseudonyms, you, you, can't, you can't just get that because um, that, that will open you up to repeated exploitation. Now, we have this very abstract game theoretic model for, for examining this over, over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, provides a way of, you know, we prove a theorem that says there's, there's, no, there's no way that you can get more than a certain amount of cooperation if you've got, you know, potential for, for bad actors coming in. But I think the, the fundamental idea, even if you don't follow the math, is that there, there's no way to uh, trust all the newcomers if there could be, if some of the newcomers could be bad, just using reputation mechanisms, uh, if, if people can, can start over again. And uh, I think this is, we can play whack-a-mole and, and move where the costs are, uh, but any system is going to have something like this. We, we did a similar analysis to this, focusing on a particular way of, of, uh, of using reputations in the context of recommender systems. And um, in a series of two papers I did with a colleague, Rahul Sami, uh, the first one, we showed how you could use reputations to make an influence-limited recommender system. So, uh, people try to, this is the, the Sybil problem that people were talking about yesterday. Someone's going to create a bunch of accounts and try to use that to manipulate the, the ratings of some new movie, the recommendations that will that, be made about it. And uh, somebody's trying to get in at the door behind me. I guess I'll find another way. Um, the, uh, you can, uh, through a process of starting every new account with a very minimal reputation and therefore a very li limited influence, and then incrementally uh, adding to the amount of influence that that account can have on the, rec on the recommendations for other people, you can, uh, and inc incrementally adding as they prove to be useful, uh, as they've act the recommendations that they've given actually turn out to be informative. 
If you do that, you can create a, a process that is provably resistant to manipulation, that is a bounded number of, of, uh, of civil accounts can only have a bounded number, a bounded amount of damage. But in order to do that, you end up throwing away information from those, most of the people who were the good guys, because you're bounding their influence also until they prove themselves to be, to be trustworthy. And in a follow-up paper, we showed that there may be other techniques besides the, the exact influence limiter algorithm that we had, but any algorithm that is resistant in, in this particular way to, to, that, to a manipulation by a, a bounded number of attackers must throw away the same order of information from the good guys that, that the influence limiter does. So this is, again, sort of a, an, an impossibility result. You can't go looking for, uh, for nirvana that, that, that we're going to somehow trust all the good guys and, and not let all the bad, any of the bad guys do any damage. The, the efforts to, to limit the, the bad guys' damage are going to, to reduce the utility of the good guys as well. And we, we actually ended up um, suggesting one possible uh, new, new point in, the, in this uh, identity continuum that, that, that uh, Kalia was talking about. This is actually still from the, from that, the paper with Eric Friedman. So if you, you think about anonymous interactions, the ID changes every time. If you're identified, your, your, uh, your real identity, your, you never change your identifier. And with pseudonyms, you change them whenever you want to. And for reputation sharing, with uh, the pseudonyms, we only get the positive reputations. Uh, the, the negative reputations don't stick, so you might as well not have them. And therefore, we have co trust and cooperation only with those people who have a positive reputation, not the people who have who are new and have zero reputation. Yeah, Kalia, you wanted to. That's right. This is this is uh, pseudonyms that you can acquire as many as you want at will. And and our and our suggestion is that uh, we should add some form of expensive pseudonyms. And the, of course, the, one of the problems with expensive pseudonyms is that they'll drive away the newcomers, just like paying paying your dues will. Uh, and our suggestion was make the first one free and make the subsequent ones expensive. So within any particular arena, we call it 1L, once in a lifetime pseudonyms. So for once in a lifetime, it's free, uh, but, but when you want to try to replace it, you've got to pay something for it. So you reveal your name to a third party, and, and that third party won't reveal the mapping to, to, of names to pseudonyms, and we even developed a cryptographic method so that the third party doesn't have to know them know the mapping. It may be that this was more of a theoretical idea than, I, I haven't yet seen it uh, play out, but uh, certainly the costly one, ones, I think we, we could, you can do something around that, where we say, hey, come on, join, but when you want to get a second pseudonym, you have to do something more that makes that costly. And then we do an analysis that says, hey, if you do this, now you can start trusting, if you assume that most people are good, as I think that is, is the truth in the world, uh, but there are some bad people, you can start um, trusting the people who have zero reputation as well as those people who, who, who already have a positive reputation. And then you just get a little limited damage of a few people who are bad, and, and they can damage you a little bit before you notice, but they can't come back and do it again. So implicitly, there is some verification of who really is who. Uh, with the, uh, in other words, if you're Paul Resnick and you choose PR1 as your first student for free, and you screw up, they have to, they have to, that you are Paul Resnick when you're trying to get another one, they don't get. Yeah, they have to do some, they have to be able to do something that says, we've, you've been there before, you can't go again. So I have to give them something that, so you can imagine that it's, uh, it's a credit card number. All right, I can get a few pseudonyms this way, but only as many as I can get credit cards. Uh, you know, something, something that is, is limited. Uh, but this is one interesting difference between this approach and the pay up front approach. Because in the pay up front approach, <coughs> people didn't have uh, limits on their credit, right? The only people who would be willing to pay up front are those who plan to do a good job. Because otherwise, they're going to lose that deposit. 
Right, so. Here, you need this added level of uh, enforcement. Right, so another possibility, and this, is, this isn't here, but, but, but another possibility that Steve is, is, uh, is alluding to is that we could have bonds. If we have some way of measuring performance, we can say, when you come in, uh, you got to put up $100. Uh, if, if the community doesn't hate you, you get to, we'll never, you know, you, you'll get to have your $100 back. If the community does hate you, then, then you lose your $100. I think that's another possibility, but it's again another hurdle that maybe, you know, I, I just made all my students make an edit on Wikipedia, and they were scared enough already, um, because and with good reason because a bunch of them got reverted. They thought they were doing it right, and nope, revert, no explanation. So uh, you know, I, I think if if they had to put up the hundred dollars, a lot of them would have quit the class. All right. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's, that's what I had to say about, about, the, we should, about, the, uh, about the, the pseudonyms and the impact on, on how well reputation systems can work. One possibility is to try to have something that makes the pseudonyms more expensive, or maybe that makes the second pseudonym more expensive. Uh, if you don't do that, then we have this inherent limit that we're going to have to distrust the newcomers or do something like that that, that requires the new, newcomers to pay their dues. I want to completely shift gears now and tell you something about uh, what, what I've been thinking about the startup problem of getting to critical mass. So this is not particularly about reputation systems, but it's about the project as a whole. It was mentioned yesterday, we've got this book coming out, Building Successful Online Communities, uh, with Bob Kraut and um, a bunch of uh, others joining us on particular chapters, including John Riedel, who's here. This is a book that came out of this, a commu the Community Lab Research Project that, that we did, I guess, it ended a few years ago now. But the book is just coming out. One of the chapters is on starting a new online community. Um, and a way to think about the problem, about some of the problems of starting a new online community is through the lens of network externalities. That is, when the value of being in this community depends on how many other people are in the community and participating. Now that could be a negative externality. The more other people there are, the harder it is to get my voice heard, uh, the more stuff I have to wade through. So there could be congestion, uh, but more typically we think about the positive externalities, and I think these are critical for the, the, the startup phase, that if this is a a community of people who are annotating web pages, and I pay the startup cost of installing the, <coughs> the browser ex extension or whatever, uh, or I you know, have a bookmarklet and I get to a page and I say, what, what are, what's the commentary on this page? And I try it five times and there's never any commentary because there's nobody else there. And they say, forget it, and I, and I don't use the system. Uh, so. Other people interact with the content they produce. Um, the identity value, I get to go around saying, hey, I'm a member of, of Hypothesis, and everybody says, what's that? That's not nearly as valuable as going to the cocktail party, and I say, oh, I'm a member of Hypothesis, and they say, wow, me too. So those are all kind of positive externalities, but you don't get there uh, because uh, the, the people who are uh, the value that people are going to get from those positive externalities aren't there when they have to make their decision about whether to join. They're somewhere in the future when everybody else joins. So some, some implications of positive network externalities. One is that there's, uh, if there are two competing services, there's likely to be a winner-take-all phenomenon. One of them gets ahead. There's more people there. It's now more valuable than the other one because of all the people who are there, even if the features in it aren't quite as good as the features in the other one. And the other uh, implication is, is this need for critical mass. Because uh, if there aren't enough other people, when I go and decide to, do I want to join, they're not there yet, so I don't join. And then, of course, I'm not there to create the externality for the next person. So that, that uh, lets us identify three challenges in the startup phase. Uh, Identifying a niche that you're going to serve, competing for that niche, and that's where that, the winner-take-all competition is going to have an effect. And the third is getting to critical mass. I want to focus on the getting to critical mass part here. And there's, 
I think two um, things that you can do as a solution to this. One is to leverage the early members, make the, those people who do come be especially valuable. And the second is to try to get some early members despite the fact that you don't yet have critical mass. How to get some of those people who might, stick, might wait till later to see if you're succeeding to get them to decide early on to join. And I want to focus on that second one, attracting the early members. All right, one equation. And the reason that, or a set of equations, the reason I'm, I'm putting these, these up here is because these are going to, the terms in these, in these models are going to be the thing that guides our attention to the, the possible ways of addressing the startup, uh, the getting to critical mass. So imagine uh, somebody deciding, they, they've just come to, to, to some service, say hypothesis, and they're deciding, should I join now? Or should I wait and see if it catches on? If it catches on, I'll join later. It's a really cool idea, but do I want to join now? What's the utility of joining now? Well, there's, there's some benefits I'll get right now. Maybe they're not that high because there are not that many other people, but there's some benefits from joining now. But there's a startup cost for me. I've got to install the software. I've got to learn how it works. I've got to invest some of my time. And then, in the future, maybe hypothesis is going to catch on. And I have some estimate of the probability of success. There's a 30% chance that it's going to be the next great thing. And if it is, there's going to be um, some, some benefits that I'm going to get later, which are even bigger than the benefits I get now. Because now there's going to be lots of annotations and, and all of that stuff. And, and I'm going to have, you know, go to cocktail parties and say, I'm a member of this thing. And everyone's going to say, wow. But there's also, potentially, an early adopter benefit. When I go to the cocktail party, I don't just get to say, I'm a member of this. I get to say, I was one of the early members of this. So I'm going to get some cool factor from that. Maybe I'm going to get some extra benefit later on when it's successful because I started early. On Slashdot, you're cool if you have a low uh, member number because the member numbers are given sequentially. That means you were there a long time. Um, there, are, there are other ways that you, that, and, and I'll actually talk about that this is a design opportunity. Think about creating some of these early adopter benefits. OK, but what if, what if I don't join now? What if I wait? Well, there's that 30% chance that this is going to be a great thing. And I'll get all the benefits. Whether I join now or, or later, I'll get all those benefits. And I'll only pay the startup cost if if, uh, if it actually turns out to be a successful community, because I, I won't have bothered to waste any of my time if the community doesn't take off. So if we want to get people to join early rather than later, we would want this utility to be greater than this utility. If you do that, you end up in a, with an equation like this, which says uh, the difference in utility is the participation benefit in stage one, which I get if I join now but not later. Uh, but I lose the startup cost. I lose that, uh, that cost in those cases where the community doesn't take off. I've wasted that startup cost. So with one minus success probability, I've wasted the startup cost. And then uh, with whatever the probability of success is, I'm going to get those early adopter benefits. So we want this thing to be greater than zero if I'm going to join now. All right, so this is a... You know, a lot of formalism, but I think the, the advantage of, of this formalism is it gives us a framework for thinking about the classes of the categories of things that you could do to try to make it through the startup stage. So make this participation benefit in stage one before everybody has joined, make it be higher. Okay, uh, so that's increase the stage one value, and I'll talk about a few things that you could do there. Uh, Reduce the, the startup cost of joining, so reduce this cost. Increase the success probability, or, or people's guesses about the success probability. Do things that change people's expectations. Oh, this is a 90% chance of success, rather than a 30% chance. Now it's more valuable to join early. Uh, so that's the expectation setting. You can do commit, conditional commitments that actually sort of change this, this, uh, this equation. Y you can say, I promise to join, and other people can 
sort of get some of the externalities from knowing that I'm going to join without my actually joining. I say, if it, if it takes off, I promise I'll be there. And, and other people can count on that. And uh, I think this equation also gives us some, some way of thinking about things that might be appealing as strategies, but actually wouldn't help that much. Like changing people's beliefs about how great the community will be if it succeeds. So going around, telling, the, the, this annotation layer is going to be so great, and that's why you should join now, actually isn't a very good argument. OK, if it turns out to be great, I'll join when it's great. Now, it is a big motivator for us. And we, we certainly need to be able to tell the story of how great it's going to be. But for the getting people to join early versus sitting on the sidelines waiting, it, it, isn't, it isn't quite as helpful. OK, so uh, we're, you know, I'm not going to go through everything in here, but I just want to give you a flavor of, uh, of, for a couple of these strategies, some ideas. Uh, uh, for increasing the stage one value, uh, for expectation setting, and uh, the commi conditional commitments. So in, in, this, in the book, we have all these, for every chapter, these design claims. So I've D DC 25 is design claim 25. So um, somebody is thinking about joining now. There aren't that many other people who are producing the content that'll, be, that'll make it valuable. How about if we uh, give them something else? You give them some kind of productivity tools. You give them some kind of entertainment, uh, some kind of shopping opportunities. Not obvious to me how we do this for a hypothesis, but this is sort of a, a general framework. In, in other communities, it, it's been helpful. You know, get uh, photo sharing sites off the ground by, by uh, upload your own photos, and, uh, and, it, and you'll be able to uh, print, out, print out photo books. Uh, or uh, come join Delicious. There's nobody else around, but it's really good for organizing your own bookmarks. It's a productivity tool. And eventually, other people are around, and you also get the benefit from them. So that's that idea. Another possibility is professionally generated content. If we can pick out some niche of, of, uh, of, of web pages that we want to have really good quality annotations, maybe the way to get started is uh, for six months, we pay professional uh, journalists to, to, to do the commentary so that there'll be stuff there, and then, and then phase them out. Syndicated content, if there's somehow we can pull annotations that have happened from somewhere else and, and, and bring them in, that, that was you know, somebody referred to this yesterday uh, when, when they first joined Stack Overflow. Some, I guess that was about syndicating their reputation, but, but if you can pull in content from elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, and professional staff contributions, you know, can you do something where uh, when there's a request, hey, we need an annotation of this page, if, if nobody else does it, the, the staff will, will do it. Uh, this is an example from, from an online community that was small. It was created as part of a clinical trial for, for uh, a, uh, a physical activity weight loss program. And they wanted to have an online community component, but there weren't really enough people, and they weren't, they weren't internet types, so we weren't confident that there would be a lot of, of, of contribution from them. So you can, the, uh, the staff posts are in red. And we kept having staff posts all the way through it, they were, ended up being, I think, about 30% of all of the posts were from staff. But that was enough to sort of get it just over critical mass. This is sort of the five messages a day level. And you can see, which, which is sort of the five to 10 is kind of a heuristic that people have for online communities. That if you have less than five to 10 messages a day in a, in a forum that people won't, won't participate. So we wanted to get it up above that. And, and the sta having the staff participation worked. Uh, and it made it lively enough so that there actually was an effect on the participants in the trial that those who got to be in the online community stayed with the walking program more. Okay, uh, more thoughts on increasing stage one value. I, I know I'm, I'm probably going to tax patients, so no, Dan's saying I should actually go through these. Okay, um, so the professional staff contributions probably ought to be as a last resort because you don't want to crowd out the, the, the volunteer participation. And the last idea is bots, uh, where possible. Um, you know, you've got a gaming site, and there's you, somebody signs on, and there's nobody else who wants to play with them right now. Maybe they can play against a bot. Uh, maybe we can figure out some, kinds, some kind of useful bots to substitute for the, the people who aren't there yet. 
maybe not as good as, as having the people, but what would some of the automated annotations look like? Maybe tells us the page rank of the page or something like that. Okay, um, expectation setting. So this is uh, you know, another approach to try to, to make it so that people will want to join early. Uh, the, uh, and I'm, I'm focusing on just one set of things uh, for expectation setting, which is uh, the displays about who else is there. At different stages, you might want to show different things about who else is present in the system. So when you're very early on, uh, showing, we have a new member. Here's Joe. Here's his picture. Welcome, Joe. That may be very effective early on. Uh, a little bit later, when there's enough people joining every day that, that, that acknowledging everybody individually doesn't really, doesn't really convey a sense of, of, of growth, is to, to show something about the percentage growth. We grew by 20% last month. When you're big, then you want to display the absolute numbers. We have 100,000 people. We have a million people. When you're in this stage, it's much more, it's much, it's much more, conveys much better expectations about the likely success to show the growth. Yep, we have 200 people. Doesn't really convey this is going to take off in the same way as we have 20% more people than we had last month. Yeah. causing a faster uh, convergence to one of the two extreme states of you know, success or failure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not clear to me that this would necessarily increase the likelihood of success using things like this, because if my expectation is a certain growth rate, okay, and, and that's the general expectation, um, then you have to show me that that growth rate is being achieved on, on some you know, regular basis. And if it is achieved, it's kind of more attractive. People see that. It kind of generates more hype. If, on the other hand, the actual growth rate uh, falls short of my expectation and then falls short of kind of market expectations, that will really decrease people's willingness to join. So I could see how, if it's symmetric across these two, what would happen is very quickly people will learn whether the growth rate exceeds or falls short of expectations and very quickly it will either succeed or not, but not necessarily always mm -hmm. on the positive side. Sure. If so if, if in fact you have no members, no new members, then having the box that shows the new members, and the last one was three weeks ago, uh, that you don't want to show that. So, so all of these things are, uh, you want to show them when they're favorable to you, and don't show them when they're not favorable to you. So the, the idea, of, if you've got a million members, and you're losing 100,000 every month, tell them that you've got a million members. Don't tell them that you're losing 100,000 every month. If, you've got, uh, if you're not growing very fast, then you don't want to show. So this is basically how to only tell the truth, but tell the truth that, that makes it look the best for your community. Everything that's said is true, not everything that's true is what you're saying. Yes. So I'm, right. I'm saying how to manipulate expectations while, while only telling the truth. Be because you think that the expect and, and that so that's implicit in this that that you think that there's a positive feedback effect from the expectations so that's why you want to control the expectations. And, and that's one of the key things to the network externality is that uh, you know in the language of game theory you have more for equilibrium. Right. And what you want to do is, and, and the equilibrium are self-enforcing. If everybody thinks it's going to be great, they join and it's going to be great. If everybody thinks it's going to suck, nobody's going to join and it's going to suck. Exactly. And that's, and that's why you want to try to control, exactly. manipulate it. And, and this is a sort of just a specific way of saying that we, how, how you might want to manipulate it without lying. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yes, especially if they're good looking.
Yes. Yeah. That's, that's brilliantly exampled by the analysis of Facebook's uh, IPO revenues, where they actually only have about 160 million users who really log in. Only. Which means yeah. that they're only a little bit bigger than LinkedIn. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, but those, they, they would both count as successes. If, you know, if, if we can just get hypothesis up to their level, I think that will count as critical mass. <laughs> I'm more worried about, about, so first of all, I'm saying don't, don't say how many members we have when you're starting. Do, do say, here's who joined, if, they've joined if, if, you have, if they're coming frequently enough. If they're not coming frequently enough, you probably don't even want to do that. Until, until you've done something else that, that, that uh, is getting uh, new people coming. What about like a <coughs> stream sort of thing, just so people feel, feel the flow or feel, feel the flow? Yeah, the activity stream is good if there's activity. If there's activity, right, yeah. And so if, 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 if people can see that, oh, yep, the, the, most recent, uh, the most recent thing that was put in was two days ago, then maybe not. Yeah. But if, it's, yeah, two minutes ago, then it's, then it's more... Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's what we need to have in the beginning. Right. Okay. Uh, conditional commitments, and I haven't. Um, you know, it's not that obvious how to how to use this, but I want to just raise it as as one possibility. So one of my favorite sites illustrating this is something called PledgeBank.com. How many of you have seen this site? So you, you go on the site and you say, I will do X. If n other people will do y, often y is the same as x. If, you know, if, if some, a bunch of other people will join me. Now this is somebody who says, I will wear my hair natural and promote natural hair, but only if a thousand other people will do the same. Uh, and the deadline to sign up was by December 5th, and uh, 259 people signed up, but 741 didn't. Now, in practice, you know, they needed 741 more. In, in practice, most of the things that I see on there are things that people are obviously going to do anyway. They're so committed to doing it, they're going to do it no matter whether other people join or not. But there are, there are things where, where it really is, there's some coordination aspect. I don't want to bother doing it unless there's going to be enough other people who are going to show up. I will, I will go clean up trash at the park on Sunday if 10 other people will promise to join me. Does it provide a support group also like a forum for interaction after uh, engaging in one of these pledges? I don't think so, but maybe. I think it's really just about the coordination on, on, on a commitment. But Kickstarter does. But Kickstarter does. Yeah, so Kickstarter is one, right, where you say, I will donate, but only if, if, it, if enough people are going to do it and you're released from your commitment if, if right, so that's. And, and then there's involvement with the, the ongoing project. And then there's, yes. Yes, so that's, I think that's a great example. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to use this in Hypothesis, but we could think about it. And you know, another example of where this is being used is at Meetup, where uh, there is not a bluegrass meetup in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but there are 20 people, 22 people on the waiting list. If somebody else will organize that, they'll be there. And that makes it a, a lot more interesting for someone to start the new bluegrass meetup. Yeah? This is, uh, I don't know if this will sound bad, but I made that page. You made that page? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh you, not, not, not the bluegrass one. You, 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 <laughs> You were working for Meetup, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's not this particular instance of it, but you made that excellent. And uh, and did do you know some of the data about did did does it did it help to get new things started? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They have all types of mechanisms in place to uh, create critical mass for stuff. They have lessons when you you start to organize a Meetup group itself, because even that Meetup group was trying to get enough participation. Uh, they have a thing called empty. Uh, empty restaurant syndrome, where if it looks like no one's there, no one... Someone will actually walk in, think, uh, no, this meetup isn't going to happen, and they'll walk out. So there are things that some organizers say that a higher number is RSVP than really has, until you get the critical mass of people that RSVP, and then you change yeah. the numbers. Yeah, all sorts of things you're talking about. Yeah, I, I was so... Let, let's, what, what's your name? Uh, Jesse. Jesse, let's you know, pick, pick Jesse's brain about this, because, I mean, meetups, it's like every single one of them is n not meetup.com, but I mean, I mean every single meet meetup within meetup.com has had to go through this, this uh, cold start problem. And Area 51 is another site where it's uh, trying to accumulate critical mass for a community of engagement of some kind. 
Okay. Stack over, stack over for yeah. the oh, Okay. I'm not familiar with that one, but. Oh, it's an incubation for new stacks, right? Okay, and so they you you have to have a, enough people who are, say that they'll participate before they bother to to create it. Good. Okay, so this is just a summary. You're able to read off these different categories. I didn't go through all the categories, but you can sort of uh, read off where are the opportunities by by thinking about this this utility model. And that that are that's what I. Uh, have to offer kitten wars, that is, the don't let people decide what they're moderating. Uh, social cost of cheap pseudonyms, and maybe we want to make them a little more expensive. And uh, this uh, framework for thinking about the startup costs, or the getting to critical mass.